Okay, in the second part, we're going to have a look at more of the details of God's place that he asked for so that he could dwell within his people. Of course, in Numbers, it said the Levites camped right around the courtyard. So we have Moses, Aaron, and sons out to the east of the courtyard in front where people had to come to that area to bring their gifts and offerings. The Meriri family to the north, the Gershon family to the west, and the Kahat family to the south. Actually, the north family had four ox carts. They were responsible for carrying the courtyard and building pieces. The Gershon family at the west had two ox carts and they had to carry all the coverings and the linen and curtains. The Carhart family on the south of course had no ox carts because they were the ones responsible to hand carry all the holy items. We'll cover more of this later. Then further out, three tribes on each side because of course Joseph had become Manasseh and Ephraim, so now we could have, still have three tribes each side. Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun to the east. Reuben, Simeon, and Gad to the south. Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin to the west. And Dan, Asher, and Naphtali to the north. And of course they were the rear guards. Naphtali had to bring up the rear. And of course Judah was the one to lead out each time they had to break camp. Quickly look at the three sections of the tabernacle and how they relate to us. Um, as an analogy. So notice there were three. There was the outside courtyard, which surrounded everything. Then the holy place, which was two-thirds of the building. And the holy of holies, which was one-third of the building. So we can see when we look at us, we're a triune um, being. We have a physical body. We have a soul, which is the seat of our emotions and thoughts and and will even and then we have a spirit the spirit of man who responds to the holy spirit when we ask him to come and clean us up and come and dwell within so notice the inner chamber where god dwelt between the angels is this holy of holies representing where god will come and live in us now of course the next we see three curtains Christ said he's the way, the truth, and the life. So we see there's only one way into the courtyard, and then there's only one way into the Holy of Holies, and so you could say the way in. The next was next to five pillars, grace and truth. And of course the next one was the one with all the cherub angels embroidered onto it, the way to life, the way back to life. And we can see in these three sections between the curtains, the area of the courtyard is where redemption takes place, where our sin is paid for and we are cleansed. cleansed. And then in the holy of place, we see all the items that are for our provision and our sanctification. You know, we're constantly fed with the word of God. We're revealed, his word is revealed, and we're worship and praise. We're developing a relationship with the Lord. And then finally, beyond the veil, we enter the Holy of Holies, where we are glorified with Christ. You'll see this um, in many scriptures. We might have time to go through it later. Not sure yet. So just a little addition that Dr. Robert Heidler showed us um, when I was in New Zealand, but I think you can still get his teachings also from Glory of Zion. Um, I'll put that on the website as a link. The Feasts of Israel, as related to the tabernacle, very interesting. So for the first feast at the beginning of each year is Passover, and this is where redemption and cleansing takes place. Then at Pentecost, the provision, the... Uh, sanctification like I talked about just before of the provision of food of revelation and then there's the long summer and then we have the tabernacles where God comes to dwell with his people it was the um, remembrance of God dwelling in, in when they were all camping in tents so notice the tabernacle of Moses as we've talked about in a previous slide the outer court was the redemption and the cleansing so the sin paid for at the altar the word of God cleansing we'll talk about this a lot more later then in the holy place his provision uh, the sanctification we've got uh, food to eat, provision to, you know, may have our spirits grow, the Holy Spirit who helps us and reveals God's word to us. And then the Messiah still interceding for us, but also our response of worshipping the Lord.
And then we have the veil, and beyond that, the Holy of Holies, where God is in all his glory, and to enter beyond the veil. Very interesting and very relevant analogy. So here we go on our little journey. So there's only one entrance, as we mentioned, only one way in, the 20 cubits of colored curtain. Only the Levite men and priests could enter the courtyard to serve. We see the children of Israel could only bring their offerings and giftings to the gate. There's a bit of confusion over the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. The tent of meeting was also Moses' tent outside of all the camp before the tabernacle was built. And then he moved the law into the Ark of Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And so the whole complex then became the tent of meeting. But specifically, the Mishkan um, is the word, but is a bit of confusion because of tent of meeting. Um, Oel Moed has been used for both Moses' tent outside before the tabernacle and then for the tabernacle itself. So we notice Yeshua said he is the way. He's the only way to the Father. And of course these three curtains we have to walk through to get to the Holy of Holies. The first thing we come to, of course, the altar. So let's look at how it was built and what it represents. So see the altar was five by five square and three high of cubits, acacia wood covered with copper. Copper of course in those days still in some cultures represents judgment. So the first thing dealt with judgment on sin with the blood poured out on the horns. Now the horns were on the corners, above the corners. We're not sure if they were animal horns or just not little corners at the top um, not that it matters because the priests had to tie their bull to the north of the altar if they sinned uh, it represents provision sanctuary if somebody by mistake had uh, killed someone manslaughter we'd call it they could run through and claim sanctuary by holding the horn of the altar there still was a judgment to prove that they'd done it by mistake that it hadn't been done, planned in other words uh, later on you'll see in um, Shiloh, Yoav tried to claim sanctuary, but he had deliberately planned and murdered the king's son, uh, David's son, Absalom. So Solomon later said, doesn't matter that he's hanging on to the horns of the altar, still he cannot claim sanctuary. So notice God said, no steps on my altars. So they put a ramp so that they could work modestly so they wouldn't expose themselves while lifting the body or the portion into the altar. Uh, we'll see Aaron built a golden calf with an altar before it and said these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. We've already covered that. So pagan altars typically have steps, some with gods painted on them. You'll see Jeroboam built an altar in Dan with a golden calf to the north of it. Typically you can go there today and see the steps, remains of the steps still there. It was a pagan system. Of course this altar had poles for hand carrying. And inside was the everlasting fire, you'll see underneath, and inside the net of copper to put the sacrifice on. So God sent the fire, we'll cover that a bit later. So the priest's service was to God. And so he provided from all the gifts and offerings and sacrifices that the people brought. So we can see what was put on the altar was for God only. Of course, when you we've already covered that the life is in the blood, so it had to be poured out around the altar and on the horns of the altar, and no one could eat or drink blood. And we notice here that fat was also added. The people had to burn the fat to the Lord here. Of course, the fire came from God, we see in Leviticus 9.24, and the priests had to keep it burning. It was the everlasting flame, Eshatamid in Hebrew. So they had to carry some with them wherever they traveled, and some went to the incense altar, and the rest was put outside of the camp. So notice the sin sacrifice was burnt outside of the camp in that special place where the ashes were put. You'll see the references there. But the fat and the kidneys were burnt on the altar and the blood was sprinkled or on the horns and poured out around at the base of the altar. So we see in uh, Hebrews, Christ was our sin sacrifice. He was crucified outside of the city, outside of the camp. He fulfilled the law of sin sacrifice. The other sacrifices 
you'll see peace and thanksgiving. The first portion was burnt to the Lord. The rest the priests could eat. Some of the people, certain occasions of thanksgiving. So you can go and look at that later. Now let's look at some things related to sacrificing. You'll see Abraham's testimony. Notice the pattern. Genesis 22, God asked Abraham to take his only son of promise which was Isaac, not Ishmael. So his only son of promise, whom he loved, and sacrificed him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of Moriah, which God would show him. So mountains of Moriah are in uh, Jerusalem, and we'll cover that in a few minutes, because first we'll cover, notice what, after God had um, showed Abraham the substitute, and he sacrificed the substitute, so this is after he hadn't sacrificed his son, but a substitute instead. He said the Lord will, in this place the Lord will provide. In the Mount of Olives it shall be provided. In those days when the scripture was written, it was still called the Mount where God would provide, shall provide. So notice, the mountains of Moriah are where the Temple Mount is and the Hill of the Skull, Golgotha. So... Could it be that God completed his provision of his only son of promise, whom he loved, a sacrifice on our behalf, in the same place that he showed Abraham? I wouldn't be surprised, personally, <laughs> because it's in the same mountain range, and God specifically showed Abraham. We'll know for sure when we get to heaven, we can ask these questions <laughs> and see the answer. But still, Christ did complete what... Um, Abraham, you know, well, God really completed what Abraham, he'd asked Abraham to do. And he did give his only son in order to save all of us. Now, you see, Christ also followed the same pattern as the Passover lamb. So notice, it had to live with you in your house, a young male up to one year old, in your house for four days. You'd certainly see if there was any faults in it. So notice Christ came into Jerusalem on a donkey, like prophesied in Zechariah 9.9. Four days later he was arrested and sent to trial. So the sacrificed lamb had to be declared pure, then sacrificed and eaten by everybody. And you'll notice that Christ, at the trial, Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in this man, and neither does Herod. So both the Jewish and non-Jewish rulers declared him pure. And so he was declared pure. You'll see also in First Peter, the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot or blemish. So he fulfilled the Passover pattern. So we'll cover the Passover meal which really is communion uh, today, and the whole procedures and what happened. So after the declaration of purity, the blood was put on the doorpost after the sacrifice, and all the people ate the sacrifice. So notice Yeshua took the unleavened bread without yeast, without sin. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, and introduced that this was a symbol of his body broken, like the Passover lamb, and to eat it in remembrance of him. But notice he did a shocking thing after the supper. There was no symbolic putting the blood on the doorpost. He took wine after the meal and said, This is my blood of the new covenant. Take drink. So this is the first time in scripture that anybody was told to drink the symbol of blood. So, because you'll see, no one was meant to drink it in Genesis 9, Leviticus 7, 17, 3, Deuteronomy even. So Yeshua was showing that he is the one that's paying for the whole price. He's taking all our sins and giving us all his life in exchange. The life is in the blood. So whenever we remember him in this communion, that's why we're to do it, to remember him. So let's look at the altar, uh, the old covenant, the new covenant, what it all represents, how it was laid out and how Christ fulfilled it. Now, the blood of bulls and goats was only a temporary covering, so every time you sin, another 
sacrifice in order to stay in relationship with the Lord. So notice the new covenant, the blood of Messiah totally atones for sin once and for all. So now 1 John 1 9, we, how do we get our sins forgiven? We come to him and if we confess our sin, then he is faithful to forgive us sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's the fulfillment. And we'll cover that in a minute about the crucified and the resurrected Messiah. Now notice the priests never rested from the morning sacrifice that they had to do, the whole burnt sacrifice in the morning. I'm sorry I didn't re talk about that at the altar, but they were responsible to do a whole lamb every evening, every morning, even when they moved. So from the time they did this morning sacrifice until the evening sacrifice, they had to do all the other sacrifices and offerings that the children of Israel brought to the gate. But notice Yeshua on the cross said, it is finished. In fact, his last word on the cross was hushlam, which literally means paid in full. Le shalem to pay, shalem, full, complete, perfect. So he's finished, and he's now seated at the right hand of the Father because the work of salvation is completed. But we still sinners. We still live in a sinful world. So it's always been this way. Everyone dies for their own sin. But notice... The wages of sin is death. So look at this. Moses was saying everyone will die for their own sin. You can't keep this law until God himself plants it in your hearts of flesh. Romans 3.23 tells us we've all sinned. 6.23 in Romans, where wages of sin is death. So somebody has to pay. Christ paid. Also, that's Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, but Christ has paid. So we have a choice. Are we going to accept what Christ has done, or will we have to pay for our own sin ourselves? Someone has to pay. Let's cover a little addition that I found very interesting that George told me, one of the lovely tour guides that comes, believers, that when he was in Jordan, he was looking at the fields from a hill and realized, um, biblically speaking, wow, this is our altar, because the horns of the altar are on the corners, and we've already mentioned this, if someone died because of something they did, an accident, they could run and hold the horn of the altar and claim sanctuary. The sacrifice is put on the altar. But notice in the Bible, the corners of your field, they belong to God. And God said the poor were to harvest from them. Now, I, he's done extra study, I'm not sure from where, but he did tell me, in those days it was you choose how big a corner you leave. So it really was a demonstration of how much do you trust God. If you left a little corner, then you trusted him a little. If you left a bigger corner, which means less harvest for you, then obviously it was a demonstration that you loved and trusted God a lot. <laughs> so our field is our work, and our work is our worship. There's no distinction between secular and spiritual in God's eyes. Where he's put us to work, even if it's in a clothing store, Selling and being a good service is part of what he wants us to do. You never know who you're going to serve. You know, no matter if you're the street cleaner, you don't know who you're going to meet who needs a word from the Lord. Wherever he puts us is the place, you know, I often say to people, the place of God's calling is the place of his provision. So if you leave your calling and hive off somewhere else to do something that you think's worth it, you might not find God's provision there. <laughs> it's back where you left. So be very careful that you seek God as to where he wants you because he's made the plans for us. Before a day that we even lived, uh, David says in Psalms, that God already knew all our days before us and had plans for us. This is a very special point. So we are living sacrifices on the altar, on the fields of our service within this world. And God wants us there, and it's difficult at times, but he's always promised to be there with us and help us. So if we're willing to put ourselves in his hands and go through the hard things and um, obey him, we might see incredible harvests for him to bring glory to him of people who are suffering that would never otherwise have met uh, the Lord because we really are the word of God with skin on 
He's, we are his hands and his feet. We're to go out and continue the work. He's completed the work in sanctifying us and, and saving us and sanctifying us, redemption and sanctification. So he asks us to go out and continue that work while we're here on earth. Move on to the wash basin. We see that it's a very lovely structure. Actually, it was much lovelier than what we can show at the tabernacle model. It was built from pure polished copper mirrors of those days. And there were no limits. It wasn't like the copper basin in the temple that was 10 cubits across, 30 cubits round and set on 12 cows. We have no idea how big this was. Pure copper. No wood, no picture of using a human, no poles. Later on, a special frame you'll see in numbers was used to pick it up and carry it. It had to hold living water from a spring or stream. So notice that the priests, every time they did a sacrifice or offering, they had to uh, take water from the bowl and wash their hands and feet. And then every time they went on duty in the holy place again. So the Levites all day had to bring living spring water to replace it. Now you'll see in Psalms, David says, God's word is like the water that cleanses us. You'll see in Ephesians a reference. Also notice in John, Christ says that he come to me and I will give you springs of living water. So it's very interesting. He is the word of God, the flesh that be the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. So it's interesting that God put no limits on the living water that represents the living Word of God, who is the Messiah, who came to cleanse us. And there's no limits on the springs of water, living water. And there's no limits on God's cleansing, unlimited cleansing. Now, a few things I mentioned earlier about the crucified Christ and the resurrected Christ. We see this in the rock in the desert. It's actually uh, 1 Corinthians 10, which we'll quote later on on this slide. But notice Exodus 17, you'll see that when at Horeb they had no water for three days, God said to take to Moses, take your rod and strike it and water will come. So he did so in the sight of the people and of course water came. So notice later on there was another three days after Sinai of course. This was Horeb was before Sinai. Now after Sinai they already have the law, the tabernacle. They're traveling back to Israel, uh, to the promised land. It wasn't Israel yet. But notice they ran out of water again three days. There's a big murmur, murmur, murmur. So God says to Moses, take your rod and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation and go to the rock and speak to the rock and water will come. And so here's the picture of the crucified Christ who is beaten, the resurrected Christ who should be spoken to. But what happened? <laughs> Moses took the rod and gathered the people, and he was so mad with them. You know, here you rebels, must we bring water from the rock for you? And he struck the rock twice, and water still came. But notice God's response to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, and you did not honor me in the eyes of the people, you shall not bring them into the land which I have given them. What a judgment, because he did not believe or honor God, because God specifically said speak. It would have been an um, even more amazing um, demonstration, speaking to a rock, and it brings forth water. So notice this is what uh, Paul picked up on, obviously the Holy Spirit showed him, <laughs> that we, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, they all drank of the same spiritual drink from the rock that followed them in the desert, and that rock was Christ. So, as we've mentioned, the giving of the law, after that, before that was the striking, the crucified Christ, and afterwards, the spoken to rock that should have been the resurrected Christ. And 1 John 1 9 is so clear. If we come to him and confess, speak out our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. We have here another picture of the water in the washing of the feet at the Last Supper. Notice that um, before the supper, Yeshua washed the disciples' feet, got a bowl of water and humbly went around washing their feet, and Peter objected. 
oh, and, you know, don't wash my feet. And so Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. So, okay, so wash all of me, my hands and my head. But notice Christ's response, the Lord's response. He who is bathed need only wash his feet, but is completely clean. So we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and we're clean, but we walk every day in a sinful world. So daily we need to clean our feet. And again, that goes back to 1 John 1 9. If we come each day and confess our sin, the times we've blown it when we were tempted, instead of trusting Him, then um, we can clean up every day. But redemption is a done deal. We're saved by the blood of the Lamb. Now the washing of the disciples' feet also is a wonderful sign of Christ initiating the new priesthood of the redeemed. Because notice the priests washed their hands and feet. The Jewish people today just wash their hands. I know the Muslims wash their feet. But notice it's a priestly duty. So in a, way, in a very real way Christ initiated the priesthood by washing their feet. We're moving on to the building. We'll see the panels were built from acacia wood, probably all little pieces joined together to make a big panel. It was ten cubits by one and a half, and of course covered with beaten gold. Now there were twenty panels on each side, six across the back, and two at each corner. And now each uh, panel had two silver bases uh, that to stand in, and notice that gold represents righteousness, silver redemption, so keep that in mind. Now each side had five rods that held the wood together. One was right through the middle of the boards and four were on the outside with rings. So it was very easy to dismantle and put on to six ox carts. So we see that the Levites at that time, if you go back and read it, 8,580 Levite men from 30 to 50 years of age that could do heavy work, and each was told by his name specifically what his job was. So it was very well organized. Of course, it seems that they started work at 25, obviously helping skinning and um, cleaning up with the priests, but after 30 until 50, heavy work, water carrying and packing and moving, I presume. And then after 50, you retired. You could still come in and pray, but no more heavy lifting. Wouldn't that be nice? So we see here the building is an analogy of the body of Christ. So the wood, that's us. We've come to the Lord. We've asked for forgiveness, um, and he's forgiven us and shaped us in his service. And of course the gold, righteousness, we'll see we're, we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ and silver redemption. Uh, you'll see what we've, the robe of righteousness is mentioned in Isaiah, but also in the New Testament, Romans, Philippians and 2 Peter. Of course we're standing in his redemption. Um, I used to wonder why two bases for each board until I realized I have two feet. It really is a picture of one person with two feet standing in Christ's redemption. It's a lovely picture. But notice in Ephesians 4, the fivefold ministry or the five gifts that Christ gave to equip the body for service. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. So a lovely picture of living stones together. So the body of... So the next is the coverings. The first across the building, right from one side to the other, was fine linen. And so in um, Sheshmuzah in Hebrew means no color, or so white. Tchelet is um, blue, Agaman is purple, and Tulachini is the red. So each had a golden cherubim embroidered onto it. And so look at these colors. It's not green or orange or brown ecological colors. They're very bright, specific colors. Purple represents royalty or king. Blue heavens, red blood, white purity. So we could say the king came from heaven to shed his blood and purify us. He is pure. He shed his blood, returned to heaven, sits on the throne. The second layer, of course, woven goatee. I meant to mention the 
pishtan, the linen, is 28 cubits, so it covers from base to base. The second layer of woven goat hair was 30 cubits, so it covered from the ground to the ground. You didn't see the building or the colours, so there were two material layers right down the side and over the top of the building. Then the third layer was ramskins dyed red, so a picture of the shedding of blood, innocent blood. And then the fourth outside layer, we're not sure, sea lion, dolphin, whale, some very expensive leather that would have come from the uh, Egypt with them, with the coverings, with the other treasures, but that was covering on the outside. Okay, so they had no measurements on these outside layers, so they were probably open to store all the gifts the priests had to use every day in God's service, the oil, spices, incense, the flour for the showbread, and of course we see in the temple there were rooms along the side to store these gifts. So that's another clue that um, this was this open area to store these gifts. Look at the colors how God asked for them. I did not see this for quite a while. It's always in fine twisted linen, blue, purple, scarlet. So notice blue and scarlet or blue and red make purple. So we have a really vivid picture of the Messiah who's fully God from heaven, fully man, the blood from earth and mix it together it makes purple he's our king and he is pure and there's the white represented so he's our almighty he's our brother our almighty god he's the one that came to save us so it's pictured that we are clo covered in the messiah so we'll just go and see a picture now of the outside and talk about what this messianic covering and the outside could mean most likely mean from the outside all we see is a skin tent no one would see the treasure or the lovely colors underneath so notice god says in corinthians to fulfill his plan to dwell in his people and that we carry this treasure in earthen vessels and when you, the Holy Spirit lives within us, we are the ones, the body of Christ, the individuals are the ones carrying this treasure of heaven in bodies of flesh and blood, another translation says. So notice Yeshua in John 17 shows us the ultimate fulfillment. Um, Father, as you and I are one, may they be one in us. And he's praying for the disciples and all who would believe because of their testimony. So that's us. That includes us. But notice also in John, in 14, 15, 16, 17, it's all the theme of in. He is in us, we are in him. Abide in me, let my words abide in you. I'm in the Father, the Father's in me. I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So this was holy. You'll walk back to the beginning where God said, Build me a Mishkan, a place to dwell, that I can live bitoch him within them. So here we have the fulfillment in Yeshua, that once we are in him, because we've been forgiven and he's paid for us and we're in him, then God is literally getting now what he asked for back on Mount Sinai, that he can come and literally live in each one of us who are in the Messiah. Isn't that wonderful? Now just let's look at the surrounding courtyard. Notice the only pure wood that wasn't covered are these straight pure posts all around the courtyard. The only pure human is Yeshua, is Christ. And each one of these uh, posts had a copper judgment base and a silver redemption top. And notice he is the one that paid for each of us, our judgments, and he brought each of us redemption. And the pure white linen surrounding everything, he promised us never to leave or forsake us like orphans. And you can look in John and Hebrews and see that. And you can also refer back to Deuteronomy and Joshua. All of God's plans are first in the Old Testament and revealed, or how it's being fulfilled is revealed in the New.